Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dorothea von Moltke, and I'm one of the owners of Labyrinth Books. Uh, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I think that one of the great myths, I was thinking about this today, currently being peddled, is that COVID has uh, created lots of leisure time for everyone. Um, and so I wanted to start by saying that I am so glad that you are with us here and that you are um, can take a bit of time out of your busy and um, I'm sure complex lives to join us for our conversation tonight with Rebecca Jordan Young and Katrina Carcazes about their new book, um, recent book, Testosterone, an unauthorized biography. And here it is right there, beautiful book. Um, uh, a few thank yous are in order. First of all, to Rebecca and Katrina for agreeing to switch from what had been planned as a store event um, to this online event. And we are presenting that in partnership with our good friends at the Princeton Public Library uh, and also with Princeton University's program in gender and sex sexuality studies. My thanks go most especially to, to Regina Consul, the chair of GSS, who had the idea for a conversation with Rebecca and Katrina in the first place. A few practical things quickly. I want to be sure that you know that you can get a copy of Testosterone from Labyrinth at 10% off um, and it'll ship for free or you can pick it up per site. Mm. If you order it over the phones or else by sending an email to orders.labyrinth at gmail.com. And we just ask that you include a, by a, a callback phone number um, if you're sending an email. All that information is also in the chat uh, on the side. And our hours and our phone hours, our phone number, you can find those in the chat and also at labyrinthbooks.com. I will actually be taking the chat down during the conversation, but then uh, put it back up during the Q&A. Our plan for this next hour is this. I'm gonna take maybe five minutes or so to introduce our speakers briefly. And then Rebecca and Katrina will each delve into more, more deeply into one dimension of uh, the scientific and cultural life of testosterone. And then you will have plenty of time um, to ask questions. I therefore want to make sure you know how best to do that on, on this platform. It's a diff little different from Zoom, which we're all so used to now. Please go to the ask a question button that you'll see at the bottom middle of your screen, rather than putting your questions in the, in the chat feed. And feel free, in fact, feel encouraged to just put your questions into the queue as you think of them. And if you see a question already lined up there, you can upvote it by clicking, there's a little arrow next to each question. You, you can click on that to upvote it and we will see that and can then take that into account. But now a little bit about our guests who are uh, waiting off screen. Rebecca Jordan Young is professor of women's uh, gender and sexuality studies at Barnard College and the author prior to Testosterone of Brainstorm, The Flaws in the Science of Sex Differences which questioned the idea that early hormone exposures hardwire sex differences into the human brain. So the, the decade long, I think decade long research and writing that has gone into testosterone was clearly also prepared by the work for that first book. Rebecca has published in major scientific, social scientific uh, and feminist journals and in newspapers like the New York Times or uh, The Guardian. Katrina Karkasis is an anthropologist working at the intersection of science and technology studies, theories of gender and race, social studies of medicine and bioethics. And she is chair in the Honors Academy at Brooklyn College, which is part of CUNY, and a senior research fellow with the Global Health Justice Partnership at Yale University. But she also told me yesterday that uh, she's actually moving on to Emory University really soon. Katrina's first book is Fixing Sex, Intersex, Medical Authority, and Lived Experience. Uh, and that examines controversies over treatment for people with intersex traits. And again, um, uh, it seems that this is earlier work that undergirds the new co-authored um, book that we are talking about tonight. Katrina's writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Wired, 
and the New York Review of Books, among other places. And then finally, before I turn things over, I, I do want to take a minute just to, um, to say what an outstanding book uh, they have co-written. Somewhere they write, um, testosterone reacts to social situations. This is just one among many lucid and biased debunking formulations for how their unauthorized biography of a molecule um, tacks it hard against the authorized, uh, authorized version, meaning against the notion that testosterone is um, at the root of all things masculine or considered masculine. Rebecca and Katrina are uh, forceful and persuasive and lively, uh, not seldom even funny, uh, in demonstrating the fact that scientific determinism may be uh, grounded in better or worse science, but it always is also just another form of storytelling. And at that, uh, a form of storytelling that, that doesn't know its own ideological assumptions or stakes and those stakes are in fact very high. Uh, maybe my, my reading of this book um, as of much else right now is influenced by a political moment. I'm sure that it is. But the fact simply also is that this is a book that um, not least a, a book about science and power. And it rests on a dynamic understanding not only of gender, but also of race and class as part of the necessary rewriting of the tale of testosterone. Um, let's just say that the, the, the price for keeping the interpretive lenses of science and culture separate is not paid by affluent straight white men. Um, this is now uh, where I, I, I wanted to say, I saw in the chat a really nice comment. Um, one of you posted that this event will take biosociological narratives around the globe to the next level. And really that's all that I needed, would have needed to have said. <laughs> um, and this is where I would normally invite you to put your hands together uh, to welcome <laughs> our guests. And um, I don't think I'm gonna get used to not seeing you, not hearing you in the audience, uh, but I will now bring up um, Katrina and Beck, even as I try to channel your guys's applause for them Yay. so here, <laughs> here are Hi. katrina and we can clap like this like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. welcome yeah. both of you it's so good it's so good to have you here i'm now going to take down the chat first of all to give this um you a bigger screen and take myself down and let you guys take it from here okay okay um so I'm going to give you a quick outline of what we're doing today. Um, hey, Beck. Hi, Katrina. Uh, hey. So I'm going to talk first. And my job really is to orient us in a broader structure and framework for a bit of what Beck and I were trying to do in the book. And then Beck's going to take us um, on an adventure towards aggression and thinking about that. So each of the chapters um, focuses on one behavior aspect of testosterone, like uh, athleticism, and she'll explore the aggression chapter. Uh, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So a couple, couple short presentations followed by our uh, thinking together with you all. I wanna start by really giving a hearty thanks to Dortea for bringing us here, Reg, who uh, Council of the Program in Gender and Sexuality Studies at Princeton, who was really the instigator for this and a wonderful curator of talks. So I feel very privileged to be included in uh, the group of talks that she's been curating down there and the Princeton Public Library. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. I don't have many slides, but I have a few. And we will go to PowerPoint, share, and then actually, I'm down for one second. There we go. All right. Come back. Share. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Here we are. You able to see it? Yes? Yes. Okay, great. So in this talk, sometimes it'll be testosterone, sometimes it'll be tea, but I'm referring to the same molecule. All right. So 
testosterone has been really culturally endowed with aspirational and almost magical qualities from before it was even synthesized. And that was in 1935. And Something that's interesting to us is that scientists told some of the first and most important uh, stories about testosterone, one that, ones that still reverberate today. One of the earliest came from a really sensational speech given by this eminent French-American physiologist and neurologist um, named Charles Edouard Brown Saccard, and he was at a meeting of biologists in Paris in 1889. And he had done something quite spectacular. He was at the meeting to talk about the miraculous effects of this concoction that he had given himself in what was probably one of the most famous auto experiments of all time. He injected himself with an elixir of testicular extracts from dogs and guinea pigs. And you might be wondering why. And the real reason is that he was fed up with being old. So Brown Saccard was already in his 60s. And as he put it, he was so weak that I was always compelled to sit down after half an hour's work in the laboratory. So he didn't start with the auto experimentation. What he did was he began grafting testicles from guinea pigs and putting them onto older male dogs. And the idea is that in doing this, he would restore or rejuvenate the dog's youthful features. But those were really unsuccessful. Nevertheless, he kept going and he began then doing work in rats or sorry, rabbits. And those experiments with rabbits, he said, um, produced in all those animals his resolve to make experiments on myself. So mixing a concoction of water, blood from testicular veins, semen, and juices extracted from a testicle crushed immediately after it had been taken from a dog or a guinea pig, he injected himself 10 times over over a three week period. And he noted what he called a radical change one day after the first injection. After three injections, he felt his forearm strength was restored to that of three decades earlier. His stamina at work had improved. His facility of intellectual labor was better. And some of the most dramatic effects, though, might really be uh, ones that we wouldn't expect. His jet of urine, he said, was 25% longer after the initial injection, but by far the greatest effect was on his expulsion of fecal matters, remedying what he called one of the most troublesome miseries of advanced life, the diminution of the power of defecation. And he was exuberant. Even on days of great constipation, the power I long ago possessed had returned. He couldn't really pinpoint though, whether it was the dog testicles or the guinea pig testicles that were responsible for the potion's punch, but the two kinds of animals have given the liquid endowed with a very great power. The actual improvements that he saw lasted for a month, but when he stopped using the injections, he actually went back to baseline and he viewed that as further proof of the effect of what he called the spermatic fluid. Despite what appeared, appeared to be great promise, what is now the New England Journal of Medicine was quick to debunk him. And they cautioned against what they called a silly season that could encourage charlatans and quacks making mischief. They wrote, the sooner the general public and especially septuagenarian readers of the latest sensation understand that for physically used up and worn out, there is no secret of rejuvenation, no elixir of youth, the better. So what was Brown Saccard doing? Well, part of what he was doing, like what was the theory behind what he was doing, is he was building on the idea that te testicular tissue, because remember again, this is before testosterone had been isolated, that that tissue contained the tissue, uh, the substance responsible for strength and virility, and even many thought for masculinity itself. And so in the decades that followed, scientists who were keenly interested in understanding the root of observed sex differences looked where they understood them to be, which was rooted in the gonads. So they went about castrating animals and observed which functions and tissues were affected, focusing on what they understood to be masculine effects. So mounting behavior, for example, in rodents. And then what they did is they sought to restore those functions by implanting bits of testicular tissue. 
if the affected functions were restored, then they attributed those changes to their glands and their secretions. What's interesting though, is that often enough, the tissue wasn't even connected in any significant way during the implant process. But the ex early experiments with so-called sex hormones, by which I mean estrogen and testosterone, quickly yielded findings that researchers themselves described as strange, kind of paradoxical, anomalous, and not least because the hormones were not sex exclusive, by which they meant that testosterone wasn't exclusive to men and estrogen wasn't exclusive to women. And because their functions went well beyond sexual characteristics. So testosterone, for example, influences many biological processes and is critical to heart function, liver metabolism, and bone development, which is something that a lot of people do not know. So these puzzling and contradictory findings, though, really did little to sort of deter this engine of research down this area and little to undermine the idea that testosterone was the male sex hormone and really the molecular driver of all things masculine. So that the hallmarks of T have been yoked exclusively to men and that the hormones effects have been credited as the primary drivers of sexual development and sex difference is really less a function of science as these early experiments show us and more a function of ideology. In subsequent decades, serious researchers once again picked up where brown Sicard had left off as if there had been no critical interruption. And there was more rejuvenation experiments with implantation and grafting of testes from younger to older animals and preparations based on the testes of goats, rams, and boars, all of which were injected into men. So by now we're talking 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. And just to give you a sense, um, these particular, um, sorry, this is Brown Saccard's Elixir of Life. Um, these particular kinds of experiments and who was taking advantage of them, sometimes really prominent people that should say Elixir, not Elixir, if I see that typo now, um, were very prominent people um, whose names we would all recognize. And so it was making uh, the front page of the newspapers even. Um, in subsequent decades then, as people were pursuing this, um, the claims went well beyond what contemporary ideas about tea would lead us to um, expect. One key figure during this time was actually Leo L. Stanley, and he was the chief surgeon at San Quentin Prison in Northern California for about four decades. And he took advantage of that position and the population in the prison to perform 10,000 testicular implantations during the time that he was there. And the range of things that he claimed it was that um, these transplantations would cure was incredible. Everything from senility, asthma, dementia, diabetes, TB, gangrene of the toe, et cetera. Um, it continued on also with Serge Voronov and he was a really significant um, Russian surgeon who had worked with Brown Sicard. He was one of his uh, students and he may have made the grandest claim of all. The testicular matter pours into the stream of the blood, a species of vital fluid, which is, restores the energy of all the cells and spreads happiness. And at a medical meeting in London in 1923, Voronov announced that Pasteur's Institute um, was constructing an immense park in Africa to breed chimpanzees for their glands um, so that those could be transplanted into men. So among other things, it was the criminal origins of a better erection. So it's easy, you know, in our contemporary moment to look back askance at some of these claims, which can come across as quackish, outlandish, blatantly racist, but today, any surgeon, and sorry, today, any surgeon hawking a procedure to remedy such a vast range of ailments and conditions would be greeted with immediate skepticism, uh, not only by the professional colleagues, but by lay people as well. Yet as much as the narratives of tea have changed, one thing hasn't, and that is that tea isn't just potent, it's omnipotent, it's magic. So coming to the current moment, in 2017, Sorry, there's our monkey colony. Um, in 2017, in an internal memo, 
uh, from Google engineer James Damore, he blamed the dearth of women in tech on a lack of testosterone. It was written and circulated at a time when Silicon Valley was under fire for having so few women in high pay, high prestige positions. And because it, uh, it garnered attention because it also directly challenged Google's program for addressing discrimination, which had nothing to do with hormones. And he's really just one in a long line of spokespeople for T as an architect of structural inequality. So for almost any social ill or problem, there's someone out there peddling the idea that T is to blame. Why are there so many more men in prison? Well, T drives aggression and antisocial behavior. So naturally men with their higher T get locked up more often. Or how to explain the ubiquity of rape in the armed forces? Well, gee whiz, the hormone level created by nature sets in place the possibility for these types of things to occur, said Senator uh, Saxby Chambliss of Georgia in a 2013 hear hearing on sexual assault among the troops. In 2016, Hert Wilders, a far-right Dutch politician, folded immigration fears and anti-Islam diatribe into this narrative when he called migrant men Islamic testosterone bombs as he handed out spray cans of red paint to women to protect against sexual assault from asylum seekers, he said, made Dutch women unsafe. That's a lot to pin on a single molecule. So in writing this book and even the longer period that Beck and I have been working together, which is now a decade, um, we came up with a term called T-talk. And it's a term that we developed to capture the web of direct claims and indirect associations that circulate around testosterone, both as a material substance and as a multivalent cultural symbol. So what T-Talk does really is to weave folklore into science as scientific claims about T seemingly validate cultural beliefs about the structure of masculinity and the natural relationship between men and women. At the root of T-Talk, and this is the work that we're building on, is the sex hormone concept. And basically the idea here is that testosterone and its partner estrogen are framed as a heteronormative pair binary, dichotomous, and exclusive, each belonging to one sex or the other, and locked into an inevitable and natural war of the sexes. So if you think back to where I began, we already know that those ideas that are still widely circulating today, everywhere from you know the National Institutes of Health to, New York, to the New York Times, was already being undermined and questioned as long as 100 years ago. So our work builds on the extensive critiques by biologists and other feminist STS scholars who have shown that the sex hormone concept shapes how scientific information about tea is gathered and interpreted, but it also does something more important that was really of interest to Beck and I, which is that it blocks recognition and acceptance of scientific evidence that doesn't fit the model. So tea talk goes beyond the sex hormone concept in a couple of ways. One of them is that it lends this kind of uh, Stephen Colbert truthiness to a number of arguments that would otherwise appear as mere contrivances. The ubiquitous and common sense notion of tea as an overwhelming super substance not only substitutes for evidence, but sometimes makes any call for concrete empirical details about what tea actually does seem puzzling or obtuse. Like, why would you ask this? We all know what it does. Second, while tea is a cynic doke for masculinity, which is also an abstraction, um, T can also symbolize biology or nature in general, as well as science and the associated values of precision and objectivity. So because T is coded as natural and in the realm of biology, just mentioning T can lend the veneer of science to anecdotes. And by virtue of seeming to be about biology, testosterone can also serve scientism. And scientism is basically the elevation of scientific values, evidence, and authority above all other ways of knowing, even as it paradoxically obviates the need for evidence. So scientism equates scientific knowledge with knowledge itself, especially valorizing the natural sciences. It also promotes forms of authority in which something is a fact or a scientific because a scientist says it, not because it meets any other particular criterion of method. The final thing uh, or way in which T-talk builds on the sex hormone concept is 
by looking at how the stories about T are threaded through with animism. So in this case, T is a willful character. When T whispers instructions in the ears of hapless men, it's clear that T has a plan, and that plan is to maintain the natural order of things. In a context like this, resistance is futile. So across the domains that we examine, and again, Beck will talk about aggression, we see T-talk working both in science and at odds with it. Um, T-talk frames social issues also as a matter of the chemicals functioning inside individual bodies, leaving scant room for functioning, or sorry, scant room to consider power asymmetries, structural arrangements, or histories, and their current material consequences. To give an example, if excessive, or vi um, if excessive violence in American policing is explained by an epidemic of testosterone abuse among police, which people have suggested, how does this square with the fact that people of color, and especially black people, are so disproportionately on the receiving end of police violence? So it's not a harmless theory. Looking for the T talk, looking for T talk is one of the core strategies that we use in examining work on testosterone, but we can't peel away the T talk from the science and reveal some pure evidence. But it is possible to trace how T talk operates and to locate it contextually and historically in the science and to identify the work that it does and the effect that that work or research has. So, echoing philosopher Elizabeth Wilson, hi Liz. I think you're on here. Um, we take science seriously, but not literally. So we respect science and the kind of evidence that careful, methodical, empirical investigations can provide. But at the same time, we're really aware that scientific findings are constructed out of specific research questions, the tools scientists use, and the enormous array of methodological choices including what to measure and how, which groups or situations to compare, what statistical methods to use, and on and on. We are doing what we've called a critical excavation of science, and we think that's critical because the hormone can take many forms and they aren't all equivalent. So what do I mean by that? Well, when considering tea that's naturally made by our bodies, there's total tea, free tea, bound and unbound tea, bioavailable tea, and more. There's also tea in the blood, in saliva, and in urine. And then there's baseline tea, reactive tea, tea at different points in the diurnal cycle, and more. So for any time we're talking about tea, we actually have to be specific across all of these versions or multiplicities of tea. Um, there are also um, quite a few versions of every single uh, physical characteristic behavior or process that scientists relate to tea. Thousands upon thousands of pages have been devoted to defining and refining the concept of aggression alone. So when someone claims testosterone increases aggression, we actually have to also ask which testosterone increases which aggression in which context. T, the molecule, is a fascinating substance, but the story has, but T, the storyteller, has more power. Written more than 100 years ago, T's story is a fable that has barely been updated. Our book rewrites that fable. So I'm trying to get here, huh. trying to bring, here we go. Hi, uh, is your, um, can you, can you unmute yourself? I see that you are, you're muted and I'm not able to unmute yourself, I'm, I'm, I'm unmute you. Do you see the red mic icon? It's not, you see it and it's not working? Um, okay. Oh, no. So here's, here's, I think, what we'll do. Um, the, the quickest fix to that will be for you to go out and come back in. Um, and um, Katrina, maybe while uh, Beck does that, uh, I will ask you this question that's already in the queue that follows closely on what you just talked about, and that will give Beck a, a moment mm -hmm. to, to come back on, uh, which is she, um, we have so someone in the audience wondering whether the, um, the magical uh, properties attributed to test testosterone have a kind of co-equivalent uh, mythos um, in magical thinking around estrogen as the substance of femininity. So if you want to just think out loud about that for a second while we bring back up. Yes, I, I think it is, but it never quite 
it hasn't taken on. So there's no question that there's still this sex exclusive idea that anything masculine is driving, um, sorry, any behavior understood to be masculine is being driven by testosterone in men or women. Are you okay? <laughs> Yay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just finish this quickly. Um, but it doesn't, because we pay more attention, I think, to those behaviors coded masculine, there's not nearly the kind of storytelling and lore associated mm -hmm. with estrogen and femininity as what we get with um, uh, testosterone and masculinity, in part because it has been so driven, this research, also by these decades long rejuvenation efforts where that was and that just wasn't as prevalent um probably in part because there weren't as many women scientists who found that to be uh compelling um, although can i just quickly i mean yeah. I, I was out of here so probably uh maybe i shouldn't say something but i want to which is that there is an awful lot of folklore about women and hormones and estrogen it's just that we make an error when we um try to see it as logical. And so, for example, it's funny that on the one hand, testosterone is out there as an explanation for everything, you know, all these huge array of things. And it's supposedly so much, you know, it's about masculinity. And at the same time, it's women who are pegged often as hormonal, as out of control because of hormones. So it's, it's, it's really quite complicated. But um, anyway, that would be my two cents worth. So, Beck, did you want to share your screen and talk a little bit about male aggression? I actually have to share it. Yeah, oh, yeah you have to share it. That's yeah. right. So let me just say to, our, first of all, I'm so thrilled that there's so many people with us tonight. And I'm especially given screen fatigue right now. I'm really honored that you're spending your time with us. Um, uh, I won't repeat the thanks that Katrina said, but I'll just echo them. and let everybody know that um, my computer hates this platform. So <laughs> I apologize in advance if anything weird happens. Um, thanks, Katrina, for setting the stage and giving the bird's eye view of some of the main themes and approaches in the book. And as Katrina said, I'm going to um, now do uh, a deep dive into the chapter on testosterone. And specifically, I'm going to look closely at two segments from that chapter to give you an idea of the, the way that we um, try to weave together an analysis of how um, pre existing theories and concepts are working, stories are working, and yet there is kind of a um, there is evidence gathering along the way, and it is um, it is science of a sort, but it's a very particular kind of um, uh, conclude. It's it's a conclusion driven science instead of a you know. It's, so it's a good way to understand um, the way that science in the real world often falls very far away from idealized views of, of science. So I am not seeing any of the slides. Yeah, I was actually just about to, to okay. email. Um, because I can't see myself, I can't share the screen. So I just um, need to be up for one second. Okay. Perfect. To... Perfect. Uh, I should be able to do it right away. Okay. Great. Uh, let's see. Uh... Shoot. Hold on one second. I just have to get out of this one and open yours back. Yeah, sorry. Oh, shoot. Sorry about this, folks. It's my my computer will not allow me to share uh, with this platform. Um, okay, hold on one sec. There we go. Okay, let me just get rid of that. And then what you're about to see, I'm going to go ahead and describe what the first slide is. It's, um, the, it's a 1971 page from the Washington Post. And I, I know that it's small print, but I want to give you a sense of what it is anyway. Maybe you, I'm hoping you can read it. Um, you'll see that the top headline reads, Army Recounts Testimony of Cali Unit. And then at the, the bottom with the picture of the man's head, uh, a general and colonel accused of war crimes cover up. And then in between those, we see Army Studies Tests of Aggressiveness. So in a military courtroom at Fort Benning, Georgia, 
on March 15th, 1971, prosecutors gave their closing arguments against Lieutenant William Calley for the most notorious massacre of the Vietnam War. Three years earlier, dozens of US soldiers had murdered, raped, and mutilated scores of unarmed civilians in the Vietnamese hamlet of My Lai. Though more than 100 men participated in the atrocities, Cali was the only person ever convicted. The brutality and scale of the violence at My Lai astonished most Americans at the time. But an explanation of sorts can be found in this um, front section of the Washington Post that you're looking at. And you see how nestled among these articles about My Lai is this, uh, this article on army psychiatrists. Um, and that, uh, that study announces army psychiatrists are studying the relationship between male sex hormones and aggression to find a way to keep irrational killers out of the military. Now, no one directly said that these war crimes were caused by a particularly ferocious case of testosterone poisoning, um, but the connection is clear. Dr. Robert Rose, one of the two authors of the um, the research, or that one of the two researchers and um, psychiatrists who were doing the studies profiled in this article, was quoted as saying, we're trying to weed out people who can't handle their aggression, people who are so aggressive that they haven't learned how to control it. So here we see an example of what Katrina was talking about, the work that T-Talk does over and over when broad patterns of behavior are viewed through the lens of T. Callie's trial shifted the focus from atrocities committed by an entire battalion to the actions of one, quote, bad apple soldier. This should sound familiar with the way that, that there are competing narratives going on right now in terms of police violence and police murders uh, of Black people in particular. So in other words, it shifts from a structural or institutional problem to an individual one. And the research described by Robert Rose facilitated that shift by suggesting that individual biochemistry could explain certain forms or levels of violence, and that understanding biochemistry would be the best and most efficient way to prevent problems like the My Lai massacre. At the time his tea studies were paired in the Washington Post with this story about William Calley, Robert Rose was a young civilian psychiatrist working um, at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And his research on tea and aggression mm -hmm. among soldiers and prisoners is still influential. Don't go to that one yet. Yeah, yeah I went back. <laughs> yeah, we're sticking with that, thanks. So uh, when the Post previewed Rose's research, he and his research partner, Leo Cruz, had just completed a landmark study on prisoners at the Patuxent Institute in Jessup, Maryland, a facility that allowed indefinite confinement of people considered to be, quote, hab habitual criminals and also, quote, a clear danger to society. When they did their study, there was a lot of scientific debate about how best to measure aggression because, uh, or violence, because things like personality tests um, or interviews by psychiatrists or any of the other means don't necessarily capture somebody's behavior in the real world. And that was well recognized. And also that there are many different um, forms of violence and aggression. And, and there was argument about whether they, they were all of, of real interest. So Cruz and Rose's decision to study the prisoners at Patuxent seemed ideal because incarceration at that specific facility was taken as strong evidence of important real world aggression. For more than 50 years, this has been one of the most uh, influential studies and has been a go-to evidence uh, that higher T is associated with serious violence and specifically with criminal violence. But how did they get to this finding? Setting out to test the idea that aggressive prisoners would have higher T levels than non-aggressive prisoners, they began by selecting 21 inmates and dividing them into two groups, one group of so-called fighters and the other non-fighters, depending on whether they'd had no fights or just one fight while incarcerated versus more than one fight. And then they, uh, they measured these uh, men's testosterone every day over a period of two weeks and they calculated an average T level. This was all considered excellent science. Um, they were careful to get the T measurements at the same time of day and so on. But they also calculated three different aggression scores. 
and into those aggression scores for each inmate. They used uh, data from everything in their prison records. They included items that you might expect, such as physical fights, making threats, or destroying property, although that's a really, really great example of is this violence or not? There's a obviously great um, discussion going on right now about that, but also some things that would um, I think strike most people as out of place in an inventory of, of violent behavior, such as um, cursing or refusing to obey officers. The second set of data came from standardized psychological testing, uh, assessing things like subjective feelings of aggressiveness. And finally, they looked at past criminal offenses, including the type and frequency of offense and the age at each offense. Um, hold on a minute. I just have to quickly reset this time so I don't go way over. Um, so here's the kicker. Uh, they, they say that in, in the headlines, in the reports, when this study is, is reported, it says that men with more aggressive um, offenses, especially at earlier ages, had higher testosterone, or typically it's said the other way, that men with higher testosterone had more violent criminal offenses and at younger ages. But despite hundreds of citations that characterize the study in this way, that the study actually undermines that link. And how, how is that? So let's go through just a little bit what is actually in there. Unsurprisingly, each prisoner's reported number of fights was correlated to a broad pattern of aggressive behavior while in, while in prison. But the T levels did not correlate with either one of those things. They didn't predict whether somebody was in the fighter category, whether they displayed additional aggressive behavior in prison, or scored higher on any psychological tests of aggression. And those were all the primary um, analyses that were planned for the study. But when this original plan left them empty-handed, Cruz and Rose went back and looked at men's records of past convictions for crimes of physical violence like assault and murder. But again, they found no relationship with T. So then they cut the data yet another way, examining the kinds of crimes that men had committed uh, before the age of 18, some of which had occurred decades, two decades earlier than when the T measures were gathered. And at last, their persistence paid off. So the men with what they called, quote, more violent and aggressive offenses during adolescence had significantly higher T levels as a group than men without these offenses. But what exactly had they done as juveniles? Well, the Washington Post report painted the men as having uniformly and extremely violent histories by naming only assault and attempted murder as examples. But it turns out that the sole, quote, violent offense listed for a significant proportion of these men was an escape from the institution where they were in as adolescents. In other words, escape from juvenile facilities. You won't find that information in the text of the paper or in any of the reports, any of the citations that we've ever seen of this paper, hundreds and hundreds, you have to scrutinize the tables. But meanwhile, the paper that reported these so-called, uh, I mean, the Washington Post reported that so-called young violence secrete more testosterone than other prisoners, which also left the impression that testosterone and behavior had been linked in real time rather than behaviors being linked, behaviors at one period being linked with testosterone and blood levels sometimes two decades later. So it's not just that the newspaper distorted the findings. The researchers had to repeatedly massage their data to get their expected result. Data were no match for a strong story. And this brings us back full circle to Milai and the conviction of Lieutenant William Calley. The Post's reporter explained that, quote, the army researchers are trying to take these results and apply them eventually to the selection of soldiers. In Rose's words, a good soldier puts his energy to a task. He uses his aggression that way. We don't want young violence. It's important for a soldier to function in a group, not go off and act aggressively on his own. So at the height of protests against the, v the war in Vietnam, this was more than a scientific statement. It was a political intervention that seemed to undermine activists' claims that it was an immoral war characterized by organized murder. The study's packaging supported the story that the Department of Defense and the Nixon administration favored during Cali's trial. Milai wasn't a gross failure of the armed forces, but the tragic and criminal result of an individual young violent who couldn't harness his aggression constructively. 
using the term young violence to describe both prisoners with higher T and out of control soldiers, Rose sweeps over the enormous gulf that exists between escaping from a juvenile detention center and the mass murder, rape, and mutilations committed at My Lai. He does so by linking them both with T, though neither Callie nor any of the other soldiers who committed the crimes at My Lai were ever uh, known to have. Nobody, I don't, I never even heard that their T was measured, let alone linked to the crimes or found to have high T. So it's not an empirical link, it's a narrative one. Inserting testosterone into the narrative waves the magic wand of scientific authority over what in the end is a particularly tenacious story and a highly charged one. If you fast forward to the present, you'll find the basic plot still intact. Testosterone has even figured in discussions of the highly racialized interplay between violent crime and the use of excessive police force against unarmed civilians, as, as Katrina alluded to, especially black men and other men and women of color. In a neatly drawn parallel, high T is seen as driving both violent crime and the rampant overuse of force in policing. In the book, we follow one especially troubling thread in this history. Given the racial politics of policing and the entire criminal justice system and the trend towards ever increasing proportions of prisoners in the US who are black, it was perhaps inevitable that the supposed establishment of a link between higher T and both violent crime, uh, as well as more general delinquency and antisocial behavior would get explicitly, explicitly racialized. Trini, you could show me the next slide. Uh, so I just wanna show you a couple of different articles that link together to make this story so potent right now. The first one, it's interesting, it began with this poorly conceived, but again, still widely cited article based on a CDC study of health among US Army veterans, again, in the Vietnam War. These CDC data were, were analyzed by two psychologists, uh, Lee Ellis and Helmuth Nyborg, who were both committed to the idea of a fundamental racial hierarchy encompassing intelligence, sexuality, and behavior, including criminality. Um, acolytes of the famous Canadian white supremacist scientist, J. Philip Rushton, these two promoted his ideas with special gusto. And, and they had already been promoting those ideas before they published this study. There are suggestions, um, traces in the literature that suggest that, that they looked for data sets that they could use to actually support Rushton's contention that testosterone was the proximate measure, uh, uh, mechanism creating broad racial differences in intelligence, sexuality, and behavior broadly, especially criminality. So it's especially important to note that this study was cloaked in uh, the Trojan horse of concern about health disparities, and even includes at the end a pious disclaimer about their concern that, quote, that nobody should misuse their findings, even though they had both already endorsed Rushton's theories um, of white superiority before publishing this paper. You can go to the next slide, Katrina. Um, among the many who've used Ellis and Nyborg's paper, none is more important than sociologist Alan Mazur. For two decades, Mazur, an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, has claimed that high T levels in young black men might explain broad social patterns of crime, such as FBI statistics from 2013, indicating that, quote, 38% of murderers were known to be black and 51% of victims were black. So like Ellis and Nyborg, Mazur used a framework that has seemingly apparently made it hard, oops, <laughs> um, whoa, there it goes. Uh, for people to view the work as racist, instead of simply claiming that black men have different biologies than white men or others, Mazur presents his theory about black men, testosterone, and violent crime as a biosocial theory that takes social context into account. One of the fascinating things about testosterone is that it's a highly dynamic hormone. In the book, we call it the social hormone because there's so much evidence that our bodies respond to varying social contexts by producing more or less testosterone. And that over time, those dynamic changes can also affect um, our receptor density and sensit sensitivity and so on. So there's this constant interplay. And while the, the authorized biography of testosterone um, would suggest that individual biologies and you know 
in particular testosterone or other features of individual biology drive behavior and drive individual people's characteristics. Um, there's precious little evidence. In fact, I would walk away from our book saying there is no good evidence that testosterone does that for human behavior. But what there is, is actually quite a lot of intriguing evidence that social dynamics and social contexts do affect um, the, the production of testosterone and the dynamically changing levels people have. So Mazur takes this fact and puts it together with, um, uh, well, I should say he, he builds specifically on research in birds that shows that, uh, that contexts of intense uh, social competition and challenge cause testosterone to rise. And that, that also corresponds with the time period when birds are fighting a lot over territory. He then quite seamlessly, um, you can go to the next slide, together with this other sociologist, uh, Alan Booth, in 1998, there's a big section in this very important paper where they take that idea about dynamism and they spin out this notion that, um, that the intense challenges faced by young black men in urban settings may cause testosterone to rise and therefore cause violence to rise. But there are many features of the way they, they draw this out that are super problematic. First of all, they're sociologists, but they have nothing to say about the social structures that actually create these challenges. All of the challenges that young black men face in these stories are completely from other young black men. And there, there's nothing about uh, structural factors, nothing about racism, nothing about um, massive structural unemployment, about poverty, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, intensified policing, uh, bias in criminal justice, none of that. So what you get is a picture of inherently chaotic and disrupted black communities. So there's this inherent chaos that then creates all these challenges, drives up testosterone, and then there's violence. Meanwhile, none of the pieces of this supposed chain are ever present in any of their, they're, they're never connected simultaneously in any of their studies. What they do is go out and find data where they'll have one piece of that, one set of, um, uh, of subjects who have higher T levels than a reference population somewhere else, but no actual data on their behavior. Um, or here they'll have data on behavior, but nothing on T levels. And that doesn't seem to trouble them. The theory keeps going on. Um, so in the end, you have this supposedly biosocial theory that has absolutely no information about the social world that people actually live in. And that is just a new form of um, racial essentialism that becomes bio, uh, it becomes biological essentialism by suggesting that somehow um, the, the loop of, uh, of violence includes um, uh, racialized patterns of social structure. So this um, allure of this story is that it sounds more modern in a way. It's dynamic and biosocial, but it's still in fact about, number one, it's about the original idea of tea as an essence of masculinity, but it's more than that. It actually tracing these um, stories, the way in which testosterone uh, props up theories of essential racial difference. And also there's a lot in the book and a lot in this chapter about uh, class difference and ideas about, um, about class as, as another biologized group requires a different kind of method on our part. We have to trace indirect claims and resonance, what we call triangulation with some evidence here and some off stage. Um, and in the end, what we find is that um, that researchers are are able to do what we call pastiche science because the story itself makes it very very difficult for people including apparently uh, scientific reviewers of these articles and people later who pull the articles up to cite it's hard for people to see the missing pieces um, and in the end we call the idea that testosterone drives aggression a zombie fact because it seemingly can't be killed with new research or new models that would make old research irrelevant or subject to new interpretations. 
Because it's so widely accepted, the zombie fact shapes understandings of criminal violence as a matter of individual or group biologies, constraining the remedies we can pursue or even imagine. I'm gonna stop there. I'm sorry, it went a little long because of our technical problems. I hope we have some time though. Erica. Do we? Hi. Yeah, of course we do. Um, and, you know, I'm going to take us a little bit past the hour here because, uh, yes, we've had tech problems and also folks can jump off and they can come back and uh, when they have a little more time and finish viewing this on, on this platform. I'll let you know you can also find this by tomorrow on our YouTube channel if you want to return to the conversation but don't have time right now. Um, so I, I do want to give everyone a chance to ask, put a question in the queue and that ask a question. Um, function at the bottom. But meanwhile, first of all, I just want to say that you guys have really given us such a window into the richness of this book, the complexity of it, as you were saying just now, Beck, um, you know, uh, it is about seeing the missing pieces and uh, together you do such a deep dive into um, so much material in order to help us see the missing pieces. It's, um, it's an incredible book and um, small wonder that I, th it, I think it took a decade or so to write. Um, so that's the, the fruit of that labor. There is a question in the queue here that I wanted to start us off with, um, which, you know, you, you have talked about, um, uh, about much, but also only a fraction of the, what the book contains, which has many chapters. And the question that's in the queue um, relates to, in, in part, to one other chapter, which would be the chapter on athleticism. Uh, but it also goes to a question that you address in, directly in the introduction um, about why you explicitly uh, do not study the, um, the role of testosterone as a, as a supplement, but there is interest here from James asking whether you, you have investigated the effects of testosterone um, on, on women, particularly perhaps in athletes who are taking it, women athletes taking it as a supplement, but also um, for transgendered people. Uh, so in hormone therapy, therapies, and uh, if you could uh, address that a little bit, uh, and I would add, maybe also explain for, for everyone here a little bit why that is not part of the conception of the book. Hmm. Maybe I'll take a stab back and then you can sure. jump in. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so um, I would say that the genesis of our work together and the person that I really forgot to thank at the beginning was Beck, who's been like a decade long thought, thought partner for whom I'm really grateful. Um, okay. And it started with, uh, I'm echoing to myself, but I don't know how to fix that. Um, in any event, it started because of testosterone regulations in elite sport and what's also been called sex testing. So we're not talking about doping there. We don't really address doping in the book, and I'll say why in a second. What we've mostly done in the book is talk about endogenous testosterone, which is natural testosterone, that which in our body, that which is already in our bodies, and that's highly dynamic, but that's not introduced synthetically, whether for illness or for other kinds of reasons. And we had initially intended to actually include um, a lot on taking testosterone. And it turned out that that part was blossoming so much that we had to make a really painful decision to not include any of the real ways in which um, people are taking and using testosterone. And yet it was a really exciting piece because what we really wanted to do was talk about it in a way that didn't center on a binary again. What does it do for men? What does it do for women? But just to talk about what does it do for bodies and what do you need to understand about a body in order to be able to say something about what testosterone would do physically, physiologically, behaviorally, or in some other way. So that's not in there. And we talk about that a little bit at the beginning. The other reason it's not there is that the stories in some ways that we want to get to and sort of pull out by the root are not stories that are 
exogenous testosterone stories. They're ones that are looking at it and trying to make a connection without supplementation. The supplementation stories are sort of the icing on the cake. They're mm -hmm. like the period to yes, aggression. And by the way, look what happens when you take it. Bodybuilders gone wild and all of that. So we thought if we avoid that overlay and just go to the root, which is also just a function of making a writable book, mm -hmm. um, that, that that's what we do. So just quickly on the sport, um, there's a whole chapter on it. We have a lot of other writings on it, but one of the, um, and by it, I mean the role of testosterone and athleticism in elite women athletes. Um, the short answer is it doesn't do anywhere near what policymakers claim. And I think for a long time, we tried to think about it logically and rationally, and nothing made sense when we tried to do it that way. Um, we looked at the science and didn't see what policymakers were claiming. They were making their own science to support the policies that they were creating and making all of those kinds of decisions that I was talking about in the introduction. Who do you include or exclude from the sample, right? And these become some really important decisions. But the idea that we came up with to sort of explain this was almost the reverse or inverse of the scientific process. And we called it opportunistic epistemology, where you start with your desired conclusion or outcome or policy goal, and then you conjure um, or craft science, including all of your methods choices to come with an outcome that supports that goal, which is different than the way science is supposed to work. And that is really, I think, some of our conclusion about what's happened with those policies. But just to finish the thought, we're not at all saying that testosterone doesn't matter to the body, that it doesn't matter for athleticism, that it's not important for that for individuals um, or anything else. We're just arguing that it's more complicated than what how people normally characterize that relationship. What do you want to add, Beck? There's this lovely glow on your face. I you're know. Like in a, <laughs> you're in a, a ring of I'm, light right I'm, now. <laughs> the light is amazing right now. Um, that was fantastic. So um, that that because this is why I love working with Katrina. That was beautiful. Um, I just would add two really quick things. One is I want to be clear that that decision was not about privileging the natural. That that really, I think, is an important thing to understand. We don't somehow think that, you know, there's natural testosterone and then there's this other realm. That's really, that's not it. It, it is the case that um, we have to think about um, studies very differently, depending on if it's endogenous or not, and that data are somewhat different, you know. But what, what Katrina said in terms of just a practical decision and the kinds of stories that we want to intervene in, what are the studies that are viewed within um, scientific communities? And there are different overlapping communities that address these different domains. Um, but those studies are overwhelmingly about endogenous testosterone. And that was another reason that it made the cut. But also I wanted to quickly just um, like um, add to that last point that Katrina said about um, the many things that testosterone does. So when, when we say testosterone is not as determining of performance at all as the policymakers would claim with these rules, it's important to notice that we're not saying testosterone doesn't do anything. We're also not saying it doesn't do very much. Quite the contrary. What maybe the biggest biological lesson maybe for us at the end of this book was to recognize that um, the issue isn't that it doesn't do very much, but it, that, that it does so many things that it is very, very difficult to interpret the kinds of research um, in the ways that a traditional um, you know, sex hormone concept would allow you to do. And that um, testosterone affects it. First of all, there's so much variability into individual variation, but it's affecting so many different tissues that it doesn't all add up to something that you can neatly package in a, in a masculine outcome in the way that lots of studies are trying to do. So I'll just leave so it there. In, in, in saying that, you've just answered one other question that's in the queue uh, beautifully, which was, what would you have all of us take away sort of um, as part of the, the core? And I think you've just said that. Um, uh, and, and in fact, also answered 
another question in the queue, um, though maybe you want to add a little bit more in, in responding to it. There's someone who wants to know uh, a little bit more along with the, the demythologizing of testosterone that you, that you do in the book. Um, what is it that, that testosterone does do? Can you enum enumerate a few things for us that mm -hmm. it does do in the body? Um, and I men, wanna, men's yeah. bodies and women's bodies, right? Yeah. I want to set this up for Beck. I want to pitch you something because it's where I thought you were going in your comments. I want to set it up and you're going to take it. All right. um, one of the things that I think we really want people to take away and to do is to actually decouple testosterone from masculinity. It makes no sense to talk about it as a sex hormone. It makes no sense to think that it only contributes to things understood as masculine. Um, and so the biggest and some of the most interesting and exciting unknowns are what does it do to and for women? Mm -hmm. And there would, you know, if we think back to the sex hormone concept, well, why would anybody look for testosterone's effects or its functions mm -hmm. in women? Because, uh, you know, it must not have a very big role. And part of the reason, there are multiple reasons why people think this, but the other reason is that women tend to have, quote unquote, so much less. And so there's this quantitative model, you know, the more you have, the more it must do. But Beck had really talked about and really started exploring, I think back in your women's health class at Barnard about the role of testosterone in ovulation. And that's one of the chapters where we really try to dig in on surprising T facts. And so Beck, do you want to talk about that a bit? Sure. So, um, um, the ovulation chapter is in some ways it's it's different from the other chapters um, in that it um, elaborates some surprising new knowledge instead of um, so much shaping it as like deconstructing a myth. Well, in a way, the myth is that testosterone is harmful for women's reproductive function. And yet um, it uh, evidence over the last really 20 years has been eking out um, it, that uh, female, meaning other species as well as, as human, um, reproductive function uh, is not just enhanced, but might actually require some small level of testosterone in order to um, function at all and certainly to function optimally. So it, it's really fascinating to watch um, to look over time at how hard it has been for scientists to incorporate this idea. So the notion is that you know when when, when you chart ovulatory cycles, um, there are these standard charts you can find them everywhere that show the hormones that are involved and show the time period. And what's so fascinating when we started um, looking into this more and reading and talking, and ultimately it was really from an interview that we did with a clinician who does this work. Um, we had gotten convinced that certainly there was a lot of data that testosterone really was important at a very early stage of follicular development. And it turns out that in order to incorporate what testosterone does, you have to rethink um, even what what time period is an ovulatory cycle. And everything has been shoehorned into a model that can only incorporate the hormones that are already viewed as quote, female hormones. So that's just, it's so fascinating. The implications go on and on. Um, there, there are, uh, I wanted to just quickly say that one of the fascinating things that is helpful to understand why it doesn't make sense to do this sex hormone classification is understanding the way steroids are related to each other and that the sex hormone concept um, contrasts estrogen and testosterone in this sort of heteronormative pair that are always antagonistic and that cancel each other out and so on. But in fact, in steroidogenesis, you know, your body um, uses some testosterone directly with androgen receptors, but some of it gets converted to other hormones. And one of, you know, the most proximate product of testosterone is estrogen. And so a lot of things that are supposedly effects of testosterone are actually effects of estrogen. And that's, you know, just another great, amazing fact. Uh, I, I'll tack on that. Um, in fact, testosterone is 
the most abundant active steroid in the bodies of most women. And this completely blows people's minds because of everywhere you go, every authoritative source will mm -hmm. say, testosterone is the main male sex hormone. It's also present in small quantities in women. If you look up estrogen, it's the main female sex hormone, blah, blah. So where does, it, where does this come from that it's, that it's pre present in small quantities? And that idea is that the quantities in women are relatively lower on average. Um, and you know, it's, it, it, it's a large average difference, um, smaller than the quantities in men. But that's only one possible comparison you could make. If you compare the quantity of T to the quantity of our other steroids, it's higher. So it's these choices about what kinds of comparisons make sense all tend to go back and reinforce the old sex hormone concept. And they wipe out all kinds of, of crucial information about what it's actually doing in our bodies broadly. Yeah, this is also fascinating. And I think you're demonstrating how the work that you do is not just about showing the missing pieces, but also then about reframing the pieces that we can see. Um, uh, it, it's, it's truly great. I have to keep the eye a little bit on the, on the clock. So I want to give the last question uh, to Elizabeth Wilson in a second. Mm -hmm. um, and just set it up by uh, saying that one of the things I admire so much in this book is the quality of the writing. And I think you've demonstrated in this hour here um, the profundity of the research and how uh, how much scientific knowledge there is and, um, and scholarly knowledge. But then it's also just so lucid and, and so, um, so really accessibly written for someone who doesn't bring prior knowledge to the book. Um, hard enough for a person to do, to find that voice on their own. But Elizabeth Wilson's question is one that I also have, and um, it will be our last question for tonight, unfortunately, um, which is just to say a little something about the process of writing <laughs> together, since as she says, um, you do seem so well suited uh, to, 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 to that sort of task of working together. Can you, Tell us, let us in a little bit on what that was. Well, I have one hopeful thing to say, which is yeah. for all of us having, you know, everybody desperately thinking I'll never do serious work again with my whole life online. Most of this book was written online with Google mm -hmm. Docs and Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but go on, Trina, you'll say something. Well, it's just, yeah, no, that's a lovely point, Beck. Beck and I, um, so Beck and I were actually in graduate school together, but, and had the same advisor, Carol Vance, but we didn't work together back then and I came to Beck very early on in the sex testing work and I was in California and she was in Brooklyn and so uh, vast uh, the last six months we worked on the book together in Brooklyn uh, but even then we did a lot of it online even <laughs> though we we're a 15 minute walk away from each other so we have a lot of um, time together I would I thought about this a lot because um, it's been a really satisfying writing process with Beck. So part of it is it's, you know, 10 years, like the nitty gritty of how we've done it. Very often one person has drafted something to get us going, right? Like a messy first draft. And we've handed it off to the other person. Beck and I have overlap in our thinking and training, but we also actually come to it slightly differently. And so we each, I think, push each other and augment the other person with what, mm -hmm. what we bring. And what we will do, which I think most people that I've talked to find horrifying, but that we have a high tolerance for, when we start to get to these later stages, it actually does not, not even later, I would say maybe about halfway through, mm -hmm. we will actually look at a Google doc together and go through every single sentence and word together. And for the most part, it's actually been incredibly pleasant. <laughs> every once in a while, you know, one or both of us will be cranky and want to move faster than the other one. Mm -hmm. But I think the key to our collaboration is what I've already said and the idea that our sense of when something is done is very close. Right. And so that makes it so that um, we both are in it for the same amount of time and deciding. I don't know. What do you want to add back? No, that's great. I mean, I think it would be very difficult for me to work um, over time with someone who didn't um, value both precision and clarity. And that 
that I think you put it really well that our sense of when something is done is is very similar. That's I'll yeah. say one quick thing. Just of yeah. course we figured this out really early on, and Beck came up with what to call it. Um, Beck's a better typist than I am, so often she might handle some of the heavy lifting of getting the words in there because I my typing is frustrating and. Uh, I would be thinking something and she would be writing it in Google Docs. And this happened so many <laughs> times that it was actually frightening. And she said that we had like one brain and two high knees. So there's something else going <laughs> no, on I, here. I, I stole the one brain and two high knees from Raina Rapp and Faye Ginsburg. Oh, did but you? We, okay, okay. We did often talk about this as the auto write function, but yeah, sometimes exactly. it felt like we were on auto write. <laughs> I mean, it was painful, but it was not, um, uh, but it was very often enough in sync that mm -hmm. it was yeah. satisfying and fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that sounds incredible. Um, I love that your answer has combined um, an appreciation of te technology and an ode to telepathy <laughs> in, in one. Uh, maybe it takes both both these things. Uh -huh. So uh, we have to leave it at that. I just will close by. Um, inviting all of you to share this link with friends uh, who and colleagues who maybe weren't able to make it. You can also find, we'll be able to find the recording starting tomorrow on our YouTube channel, Labyrinth Books YouTube channel. Um, but most importantly, uh, my, my thanks to both of you. I look forward to the day where I can welcome you back uh, into our store and, um, and meet you in person. And I, I wish you a good evening. I wish all of you a good evening and hope to see you at another online event, Labyrinth online event um, or a public library online event. Um, most of those are co-sponsored and you can uh, check out what's coming up by signing up for our newsletters on our respective websites or following us on Facebook. And um, so we do hope to see you again very soon. Uh, be well, everybody. Stay yeah. healthy. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs>